So welcome everybody to the 50, 54th Lecoq lectureship. Before we start, there were a, a, a few people I wanted to uh, recognize. Uh, and I also have to say, if we ever do this again for Dr. Matson, I have to send out a note telling everybody he's not retiring. He's, he's just giving a lecture because I, I got inundated with uh, emails uh, uh, from actually around the country saying, uh, is Dr. Matson retiring or is he sick? And no, he's just he's just our guest uh, lecturer. Uh, but we have some people that have come from really quite a ways to honor Dr. Matson tonight. And uh, Bill Obremski, one of our former residents, is here from Nashville. Bill. And and Jeff Nacht, who I just met for the first time, but I, I know of him. Uh, he's here from UBC, and I think a lot of people here know him because he was in uh, this area for quite a while. So he's come down from British Columbia. Uh, Roger Lassen, uh, he knows that I love him, and um, it's very nice to see him here tonight. And then another one of my favorites, uh, uh, John Sack is here, and uh, it's really nice to have him. And I'm sure I will uh, have missed uh, uh, a few people, my apologies. Uh, so we had a great uh, lecture and, and program uh, this afternoon, and I want to thank uh, doctors uh, uh, Abir Davies and Dr. Warm, uh, Dr. Basmania, and Dr. Kirby. We had a great discussion, and not surprisingly, Dr. Matson uh, gave a, a stupendous uh, talk. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, turn over the microphone to Dr. Matson, who's going to teach us how we can turn uh, some of our mistakes into orthopedic successes. Thank you all for coming. It's really a great pleasure for me to see all of you here and um, to share with you some thoughts. As I told a number of people, I've never given this talk before, so if it seems a little shaky, you'll have to forgive me, but uh, I was impressed with the fact that we make mistakes all the time, and the goal is to learn from those mistakes and see if we can make our specialty better. And I was obviously stimulated by Dr. Blondie and his search to make himself a better doctor. This morning we talked a little bit about uh, challenging the existing paradigm, and I used Don Quixote uh, as my emblem for that, jousting windmills, which we always feel like we're doing when we're bucking the trend. Tonight we're going to talk about turning failure into knowledge. And tomorrow we're not going to talk about alcoholism, even though many people think that that's the uh, genesis of the uh, idea, but actually we're going to talk about being careful about how we consume our work and resources. But before launching into learning from failure, I thought that I would put uh, Dr. Lecoq in a little bit of historical perspective. Um, he was, and I'm going to pick the year 1936, and he at that time was a well-respected surgeon, educator, and mentor for many of the orthopedic surgeons that were newly arriving in Seattle. At that time, Roger Anderson was the first president of the People's Town Chapter of the Western. And uh, a lot of you remember a hearing of Roger Anderson's external pin fixation and his well leg traction. And I used him a long time the RA table. Um, and uh, his son, Stuart Anderson, became famous as the owner of Black Angus restaurants and didn't follow his father's footsteps. But he was the first uh, president of the Future Sun chapter. At that time, Boeing was rolling out their uh, Flying Fortress. Uh, and that was later to do major duty in World War II, uh, bombing strategic uh, targets in Germany. It was the time of the Great Depression, and uh, Herbert Hoover had just stopped being president, but we still had our own Hooverville here. And this is a view of Seattle's Hooverville, and in the background you can see the Smith Tower, which was um, built in 1914, and for uh, until about 19 tallest building in the, on the West Coast, but I think it's sort of 
emblematic of the times that we have all these shacks that are there uh, showing how poor the, the city was in many regards at that time. Just for Dr. Sack and Dr. Wagner and those of you who enjoy rowing, it was also the time of the 1936 Husky crew team. And these, of course, were not East Coast elites. They were the sons of loggers and uh, farmers and shipyard workers. And they took on the highly trained and prestigious uh, rowing clubs of the East, including one of the ones that Ted Wagner used to row for and eventually emerged as the United States team to represent us in the 1936 Olympics, which you probably remember was the same Olympics that Jesse Owens won. Uh, first black Americans win, uh, obviously in Germany. And he, they actually managed to pull out Olympic gold in spite of the fact that they were given the worst position uh, in the whole draw, far off to the side. And for a long time, the announcer thought that the Germans were going to win, and then it looked like the Italians were going to win. But at the last second, as you can see from here, the, uh, the Huskies pulled it out. You can still see the Husky Clipper in the Conibear Shell House. It hangs over the lunchroom there. <coughs> and uh, this feat was uh, commemorated in the book uh, Boys in the Boat, which Dr. Sack recommended to me. And in reading that book, uh, it seemed like there were three concepts that we could take from rowing into the operating room with us. And I've listed them here. One of them they call MIB, which stands for mind in boat. In other words, when you're in the boat, nothing else exists outside the boat. Everything else is irrelevant. And to me, that's the attitude that we should have in the operating room. The second thing was that the Husky team was remarkable for the fact that they went fast by rowing with a slow cadence. They were slow and powerful. It made it a lot more easy for them to coordinate their strokes as opposed to many other teams that were flailing away at 72 strokes and uh, splashing water all around. So that's one of the things we try to do in the operating room is go slow, make every step count, and in the end, that enables us to get the case done quickly. And the final thing is a very subtle concept, um, and I think the rowers uh, in the room know about this, but it's called a swing, and it's where everything clicks. Everything moves together in a smooth flow. There's not a lot of extra movement, not a lot of extra conversation. Everybody's doing their thing, and that's a special moment when that happens to us in the operating room. So these are three of the takeaways that I got from that book, and thank you, John, for recommending it to us. At that time, um, we had a few hospitals in Seattle, the Providence Hospital, King County, which became Harborview, obviously, Ballard Hospital, and what we affectionately call COH, um, Children's Orthopedic Hospital, and here's a little girl with polio waving out that window. Now, one of the visitors to this hospital was somebody that you may have heard of, although I don't know that you knew him personally, but it was Jack uh, Dempsey, and apparently he liked to make rounds over there at Children's, and one day he was watching John Lecoque change a dressing. Well, in that time, we didn't have a lot of antibiotics, so they were using maggots to help clean up the wound. And apparently when Dr. Lecoque uncovered this wound, um, the heavyweight champion uh, was out for a count of 10. Since 1936, there have been 300 residents that have graduated from this program. Uh, Dr. Handler, are we gonna have uh, eight more coming up soon? We hope. So these are, these are the residents that have graduated from this program, and I'm happy to say I think I've met each and every one of these people. Um, yeah, I'm up there in blue, but it's a fantastic group of people, and they've taught us a lot, and hopefully we've taught them a little bit. So now to my topic, which is learning from failure. I thought I'd start out with this slide, which uh, showed a little episode that happened in, in 1895 when uh, this train was trying to make up for some lost time uh, coming into Gare Montparnasse in Paris and uh, apparently hit the uh, station going about 30 miles an hour and his air brakes uh, failed. So I think the lesson from that is don't go fast into the train station if you don't have good functioning air brakes. But it, <laughs> you know, it, it's just an example of you got to learn from that failure because you certainly don't want to do that one again. Um, on a more serious note, I was going to take this particular episode uh, and talk about 
learning from failure and what happens when we don't learn fast enough from failure. And so this is the Shuttle Columbia, which was launched in January of 2003. And I think that this particular episode shows the uh, consequences when we don't um, convert knowledge to failure fast enough. So a quiz question for you is, what do these five space shuttle launches that took place over five, uh, two decades have in common? And I've got the dates down there, and these are the different launches. Well, the answer is that all five of them had foam shedding from what's called a bipod ramp, which is pointed out with this red arrow, which is one of the things that holds the shuttle to the solid fuel tank. And as the space shuttle takes off, that foam is supposed to break apart. And with the first four of those launches, some of that foam hit the wing and made dents in it. But the NASA leadership decided that they were going to ignore that, that this was not important, and uh, they dismissed any further investigation of the potential impact of foam impact on the, on the wing. And that phenomenon of accepting something that it shouldn't be accepted is called normalization of deviance. In other words, we're just going to, even though we know that's not right, we're going to accept it. Well, what happened in the fifth case, uh, 82 seconds after takeoff, about a two pound chunk of this foam hit the left wing at 500 miles an hour and made what models showed to be about a two foot hole uh, in the leading skin of the Columbia's leading uh, wing edge. And the consequence of that was nothing while they were floating out there in the atmosphere. But on re-entry, uh, 3,000 degrees centigrade gases entered that hole and melted the wing and caused the Columbia to fragment at 13,000 miles an hour. And um, what's impressive to me is that the record is clear that NASA leadership suppressed the investigation of this debris impact and again called it too minor to be of consequence leading to their inaction. One of the astronauts uh, was later quoted as saying, and I'll read this to you because it's a little small, he said, I spent 14 years in the space program flying thinking that I had this huge mass of metal protecting the leading edge of the wing, and to find out after Columbia that it was only fractions of an inch thick, that it wasn't as strong as a fiberglass on my Corvette. To the best minds, NASA never envisioned this as a failure mode. Ann and I visited the flight museum and um, this was a very emotional moment for me because I'd already prepared this part of the talk. And if you go to the flight museum, you will see uh, these astronauts talking uh, right before the explosion took place. And Laurel Clark, as I've indicated here, you could see her talking to the, the microphone and to the camera and see her head bobbing up and down. And she was so happy to be coming down to earth, uh, little knowing what lay in store for her. So to me, this is uh, an example of a real failure to deliver on people's trust, uh, and we need to do our best to protect our people. And this is in marked contrast, this NASA failure, as I would like to characterize it, is in real contrast to the Navy's nuclear submarine program where Admiral Rickover really showed how to turn failure into knowledge. And he tolerated no normalization of deviance. Everything that didn't come out exactly as he had predicted became a cause of great concern to him, even if there were no major adverse consequences. And since the launch of the Nautilus in 54, there have been exactly zero nuclear accidents on any of the Navy's submarines. And that's in contrast to NASA, and it's also in contrast to what happens on domestic uh, nuclear plants. There's Three Mile Island that you know had a major disaster in 1978. So he had the ability not to normalize deviance into every time there was a, a problem, he was on top of it. So his steps were predict the outcome. If there is a, a deviation, make that visible. Get a team together to find out why that happened and never normalize any deviation from what's expected. And then spread the knowledge because a lot of people need to know about these potential causes of failure it's not information that you need to keep. It's your obligation to share it with everybody that can benefit. So in orthopedics, uh, we have an opportunity to create 
knowledge from the many orthopedic failures that we encounter. And that starts with identifying unexpected outcomes. Again, even if the patient doesn't die or doesn't get a bad result, if the process is a little high or, too, or low or in varus or valgus, we need to identify that, talk about it, try to understand why it happened and what we can do about it, and share that knowledge, whether it's in a publication or it's at a conference or through social media, which is uh, perhaps a little bit quicker. And one of the things we try to do through the, the shoulder arthritis blog is to do exactly that, try to promptly uh, display for the world to see um, what some of the problems are that are encountered in orthopedics so that we can get real-time information out there without waiting for it to trickle into publication. And that uh, blog, which we started back in 2011, has about 1.5 million page views from 100 different countries, and so at least the word is getting out there to a certain extent. So I'm going to get a quick drink here. Um, so I'm going to go through just a few examples of failures and how I think we can uh, learn from them. So I think you'd agree that if we're doing an arthroscopic bank heart repair uh, on a young person, we wouldn't expect the outcome to look like this, which is total loss of articular cartilage over the humeral head and devastating arthritis in somebody under the age of 30. And so this is a good example of deviation from the expected outcome. And even though I've never done arthroscopy, people call me dysarthric, um, but uh, I was interested in this as a failure mode <clears throat> and got curious about the role of pain pumps because many of the patients that we would see for arthroplasty gave a history of having had a pain pump after their arthroscopic procedure. And we learned that the pain pump was only approved for use in soft tissue surgery. It was not approved for intraarticular use. But the implant reps uh, or the company reps started pushing its use for intraarticular management of pain back in 2000. They encouraged doctors to use it off-label. Uh, and uh, this is, was a widespread practice. I think many of you are aware of this. And even if uh, the fact that uh, the FDA in 2006 became aware of reports of articular cartilage damage after pain pumps, no action was taken. So in 2011, um, we had the opportunity of reviewing 375 arthroscopic procedures of a particular surgeon in Oregon. And we found that in that cadre of patients, the only people that got chondrolysis for those that had pain pumps. And we suggested in the journal that uh, avoiding post-operative infusion of local anesthetics might reduce the risk of chondrolysis. A pretty soft statement, um, just trying to get the, the knowledge out there. But what was interesting is very, very soon after this publication came out, there was a current concept review that essentially dismissed our findings. And it said, uh, despite speculation, that's us, I guess, among clinicians and researchers about the causal pathways and etiologic contributions associated with chondrolysis, definitive answers are elusive. And so this is a good example of normalizing deviance. In other words, we had unexpected outcome, but you know, we don't know what's, what's going on there. But it was of interest to us that one of the authors uh, was a person who was known to be an expert consultant to industry. Uh, and could have flavored the outcome of that study. And if that wasn't enough, uh, our Academy's journal the next year came out with another assault on our findings, uh, and their conclusion was that inherent patient factors and risk factors for post-arthroscopic glenohumeral chondrolysis have been identified, but it's unclear how they interact. So again, we're not sure what, uh, what led to these uh, disastrous outcomes. And again, one of the authors of this was a paid consultant for Stryker, which was one of the makers of uh, the pain pumps. So um, we had two choices. One is just to roll up our sleeping bag and go away or to try to come back. So we got interested in um, this concept of trying to show causation rather than just association. And I got this, Howard and I were talking about this uh, last night, but one of the books that was really 
um, <clears throat> informative to me was The Emperor of All Maladies. And in that book, they talk about this guy, uh, Hill, who was the guy that showed that not only was cigarette smoking associated with cancer, it caused it. And not only was being a chimney sweep associated with testicular cancer, it caused it. So he came up with nine criteria that you can use to show a true causal relationship. He published that in 1965. And so we used his criteria and applied them to all the cases that we could identify of chondrolysis. And we're able to come out with what I think is the definitive paper in 2013, where we said the preponderance of cases of chondrolysis are caused by intraarticular effusion of local anesthetics by a pain pump. The industry was not done with us yet, though, because uh, there was a flurry of letters to the uh, JBGS saying you shouldn't publish this article because it's flawed. And there were, uh, again, uh, uh, there was a movement to have me removed from the academy because I was doing um, unsound science. But nevertheless, uh, it was finally published. And so after about a decade's delay, we now are no longer seeing cases of chondrolysis, and uh, hopefully that particular failure has been converted to permanent knowledge. Here's another failure, and these are all personal to me. This is my own patient. He came to me from Hawaii. He had had seven previous operations on his shoulder. He had an infected uh, rotator cuff repair. He had pseudoparalysis. He was really a very unhappy guy. We did a preliminary debridement, making sure that his shoulder was sterile, felt comfortable doing a reverse. We did him, I saw him three months after surgery, he was doing fabulous. One week later, he went back to Hawaii and he was trying to open uh, the valve on his propane tank and this is what happened. His glenosphere popped off his base plate. One week after I'd seen him and assured him that everything was perfect. At that time, 2013, there were no published reports of this glenosphere dissociation. I have two wonderful brother-in-laws, Kevin, and uh, who is here, and Saman Nazarian, who's a, a cardiologist in uh, Philadelphia. And he's, when I told him about this case, he said, you ought to look at the MAUD database. And I said, I've never heard of the MAUD database. But it turns out that it's an obligation of uh, manufacturers, importers, and device users to report to the FDA any device failure. So we said, huh, well, we'll go look at the MAUD database and see what we can find about Glenosphere dissociation. And the first thing we found was our case was there. It had gotten reported, so that made me feel good that this uh, reporting system was operational. But when we look further back, this had actually been reported back in 2007, six years earlier. And so that was a well-kept secret because none of us knew this information, this failure mode had not been shared with the public. So I wasn't aware of this problem and I suspect that many of the other reverse total shoulder users were not aware of it at that time either. And interestingly enough, if you believe that all knowledge comes from the literature, it was eight years later that the first publication of Glenosphere Dissociation appeared in the literature. So a long, a long delay, many cases. So we got really interested in this MAUD database and we sort of started plowing through it. And I personally looked, and will tell you, I looked through 8,000 of these um, reports and boiled them down to 2,390 uh, reports of uh, reverse arthroplasty failure and compared that to the largest series of failed arthroplasties in the published literature, which is by Bosali in 2017. And what we found is that the published literature completely underrepresented these problems of mechanical failure of this device. So I've got those in a red box there, and you can see lesser dissociation, base plate failure, and humeral component dissociation, uh, which was not reported by anybody at that time. So it made us interested in, well, how do these implants get Put into use. I mean, what is the what is the approval mechanism by the FDA? So we plowed and learned a little bit about that, and it turns out that in order to get an implant approved, you just have to say it's pretty much similar to something that's already out there, and there's not any sort of pre-market approval like a drug. I mean, if you want to introduce a new drug for schizophrenia or for Alzheimer's or anything, you have to go through a 
fancy pre-market approval, but that's not true of any of the implants that we put in people. You just have to say, well, it's pretty much like that other thing. And it turns out that 88% of all orthopedic devices are approved by this mechanism, which is affectionately known as the 510K mechanism. And almost 20% of those introduced by this mechanism are recalled. So we can tell it's not a very stringent mechanism of uh, analyzing the quality of those products. And in the lower left-hand corner is an example of a base of a uh, uh, reverse shoulder component that had to be recalled by Zimmer. And the right-hand box shows the cumulative number of FDA clearances of shoulder implants with time. And you can see that it's just rocketing up. So on the one hand, we have an escalation of the number of implants that are so-called cleared. We have no real scrutiny of how safe those are. And we have this recall uh, rate, which is pretty darn high. And so the issue for us is that, there, as we heard this morning, the use of the, and I was so thrilled to hear the the, the wonderful panelists that spoke this morning uh, exercise some caution in the use of the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. But the, the use of this implant is expanding rapidly and is now the most commonly used kind of shoulder implant, outstripping any other type of uh, shoulder arthroplasty. And this uh, use continues to expand in spite of the fact that the complication rate reported is between 15 and 60 percent. And in many of these Failure modes are design related, as I've showed in the in the lower slides there. So you can see in the lower right, you can see the, uh, the platform has fallen off the humeral component, and my case is in the middle there, and another a humeral dissociation. But there are many other failure modes uh, that uh, are particularly common to this particular type of implant. So we spoke a little bit this morning about perhaps the the more conservative cuffed arthropathy prosthesis being a safer option uh, for selected patients, those that have retained active elevation. Here's a lady uh, that had that operation. You can see the implant in the lower left. And you know, it's like all operations, it's technique dependent, but we found that it's important to match the uh, human head size as shown by the sizer up above. And in the middle lower slide, we intentionally retain an extra flap of tissue, the clavipectoral fascia coming off the coracle formula ligament to provide stability for this implant. And we're just so impressed on that, how functional these patients are. And this morning I learned that Carl Basmania, one of our guests tonight, was the, uh, involved in the original design of this implant. And it's become now my um, favorite implant for people with cuffed arthropathy and retained active elevation. Here's a paper that we've just submitted for publication showing in the blue bars the preoperative function and in the red bars the postoperative function. And in our series, we've had <clears throat> no component dissociation, no base plate failure, and no dislocations with this prosthesis. So we're questioning, again, whether the reverse should be the go-to option. This is a case we saw recently that it had a reverse done for uh, a shoulder that I think could have easily been managed with cuff arthropathy prosthesis. You can see his first complication was dislocation of the glenosphere from the base plate. The surgeon fixed that, and then the next complication was a dislocation of the uh, reverse, and then the surgeon gave up and converted back to uh, a hemiarthroplasty, which did not function well. So, um, we were talking this morning about reading outside your field. One of the most terrifying books that I've read recently is this one. The Danger Within Us. I don't know if any of you have read this book, but it's uh, it's a nightmare for the surgeons to read um, because it points out that we haven't learned as fast as we should from many of our failures. Uh, and this is a review from the New York Times of uh, Gene Lenzer's book, and uh, it talks about, of all things, an orthopedic surgeon who had a hip arthroplasty uh, that failed and all the tribulations he went through. With this particular <clears throat> implant known as the ASR, it has a 30% revision rate, which is pretty staggering. And you can see there the cumulative uh, revision rate. But interestingly enough, it was introduced in 2004, and it wasn't recalled until six years later after over 90,000 of them had been on the market. So that's a, what you consider a little bit of a delayed response. 
And, you know, we, before I prepared this talk for you, I was sort of saying, well, recall, you know, that's a good thing, you know, if, if things aren't working, they recall them. But I started thinking that we've become accustomed to recalls in, in, in cars. You know, here's 60, 680,000 Volkswagens with defective airbags that are pulled off the road and 123,000 Teslas that are pulled off because the power steering doesn't work. And so we've gotten sort of numb to this process of recalling things that don't work. But I'd like to suggest that it matters whether what we're recalling is in our garage or in a patient. Can anybody identify this man? Ted, do you know who that is? This is one of your former residents. This is John Brannigan. And John um, is also mentioned in this book. With Art Steffi, he developed the idea of a cage to help in spine fusion. And this became a very successful method for achieving spinal arthrodesis under certain circumstances, which he <clears throat> carefully delineated. A company known as Medtronic got a hold of this and decided that they were going to really liberalize the use of it, using it in the spine where it hadn't been approved, using it in lumbar surgery where it hadn't been approved. And what uh, she points out in her book is that uh, Medtronic paid 15 surgeons over $60 million to promote the off-label use of this implant, which uh, included not only the spinal cage, but recombinant bone morphogenic protein. And that off-label use uh, produced for Medtronic over $700 million in sales. And there were a number of reports of failures of this uh, particular device, but the company systematically suppressed them. They even attacked one of the surgeons in, from California who uh, tried to publish these um, failure reports and um, was successful in doing that. And, in spite of the fact that 75% of the complications resulted from off-label use of this uh, implant. So I got so enthusiastic, I wrote Jean Lenzer, and this is what she wrote back, which I think is interesting. She said, I've been trying to warn that many surgeons are not at fault for this mess. Not only is the FDA asleep at the wheel, but when things turn out badly, industry invariably blames the surgeon for off-label use or user error, even when design flaws are at play. In addition, the industry playbook goes like this. You're the only surgeon with this problem. We have no other complaints like yours. Clearly it's your fault, doctor. Read the book, you'll enjoy it. So turning to another um, cause of failure, we talked about this a little bit this morning, but in spite of the fact that glenoid components have been around for a long time, they still remain the number one cause of failure of total shoulder arthroplasty. And we discovered a while back that um, not only was this a visible deviation from the predicted outcome, but that when you took the glenoid components out, excuse me, uh, the, the uh, shoulder actually functioned pretty well. <coughs> Pardon me. And the glenoid left behind was able to remodel into a pretty functional shoulder. And a number of these patients, when we took the glenoid components out, said, gosh, this feels a lot better than when I had that piece of plastic in there well, I wonder why you put it in there in the first place, or why the doctor put it in there in the first place. So that gave rise to the, the question about whether or not we could do something to reshape the bone of the glenoid that would provide the stability of a plastic socket without the risk of a plastic socket. So a lot of residents and fellows helped with this uh, study. The red arrow shows the balance stability angles. I was thrilled to have somebody mention that this morning. The balance stability angles for a normal shoulder, and the gold and blue circles are the kinds of stability you can get from simply reaming the glenoid socket without putting any piece of plastic in there. And as I like to remind people from my studies with Nir, he pointed out that the main reason that he used the plastic component was for stability. And so we're showing here in the lab that you can recreate that same sort of stability by simply reaming the bone. We took it to the animal lab and uh, reamed some um, animal shoulders, and this is our shoulder arthroplasty setup for the canine model. And we were able to show that these uh, animals were able to regenerate a fibrocartilaginous layer shown in the upper right-hand corner that was firmly bonded to the underlying bone by something that resembled a lot the Benninghoff uh, arcade structure that is characteristic of normal cartilage. 
And it's impressive that this regeneration can occur in spite of the force of the humeral component on it. So we asked the question, can this happen in patients? And so here's a patient with a biconcave glenoid that we did this procedure on where we simply reamed the glenoid and then did a standard hemiarthroplasty. And you can see the um, fibrocartilaginous layer that's formed between the metal ball and the bony socket. So the knowledge is that the ream and run can um, produce a functional arthroplasty without a piece of plastic in there. Um, and I have just a little bit of, I want you to meet uh, this man who had bilateral ream and run operations. And uh, he said uh, he didn't think that his lifestyle was compatible with having a piece of plastic in his shoulder. And here he is after a bilateral Raymond Run surgery is doing his normal workout. This is my friend Dave McCaffrey. Um, but as Codman admonished, we need to follow each of our patients to find out whether it's successful in the long run or not. And if it's not, to ask why not, with the goal of preventing similar uh, failures in the future. So we had to look not only at the great results in the um, in the upper part of this graph, but also in those, at those patients in the lower right-hand corner that didn't do well. What was it about these patients that uh, might have contributed to their failure to get the expected outcome? One of the things we found out is that some of these failures were associated with stealth infection from bacteria that is normal in the skin of the patients we do these surgeries on, and this is our friend Propy, who lives in the sebaceous glands and hair follicles of normal skin, certainly on the skin of normal males that uh, we do this surgery on. And this became part of a, a huge uh, research interest of ours and one of our colleagues, Roger Bumgarner from Microbiology is here tonight. But we really are to become very, very interested in this bug and what role it has in the failure of arthroplasty. And to show that we put this information to use we've developed sort of a profile of the people that are at high risk for this kind of infection. And it's a young male that has prior surgery and then has a honeymoon period after their prior surgery where they're doing great and then just for no apparent reason, the shoulder starts to get stiff and painful. So this is a guy from Palo Alto that we operated on recently. When he was 45, he had an arthroscopic label repair and he did well for a number of years after that but for no uh, understandable reason, he became stiff and painful. Uh, we got these x-rays and said, you know, something doesn't look exactly right about this. So as a part of our new protocol, people that are at high risk uh, or high suspicion for this problem, we actually cultured him at the time of his index arthroplasty. And here are the culture results. All the cultures were positive for protein. So this means that if I had done an arthroplasty in him, it would be very likely to have gotten infected. And uh, I would have been worried that I had been the person that introduced the propy into his wound when in fact it had been introduced before. So we went ahead, he knew that he was at high risk for this. We went ahead with the procedure. We did a infection operation and then we did an arthroplasty operation and we kept him on uh, what Jason and I call, and Winston and I called the, the red protocol. We put him on prophylactic antibiotics and. So far, he's doing well, but obviously the story's not told. But the point is that because of our study of previous failures, I think we can identify people that are higher than usual risk for this. And once again, it's the young male, prior surgery, delayed onset of problems after a honeymoon period. I want to conclude by um, acknowledging some of the many, many uh, resident surgeon scientists that have helped create what I think is lasting knowledge from prior failures. And I'll go through these quickly, but I, I want you to just understand the power of the residents in this program and how they have a remarkable ability to be creative and to get great work done. So these two people, um, the late Jeff Sheridan and Keith Mayo, did a lot of the yeoman's work in helping us to find what a compartmental syndrome was and how to understand its pathophysiology. The late Larry Pedagana uh, and um, Al Bach 
uh, helped us use transcutaneous PO2 as a device for trying to predict which um, amputations uh, were likely to be successful in uh, Larry's case and which uh, replants were likely to be successful in l -box case using the transcutaneous PO2 monitor. Rob Beef did a lot of work on uh, compartmental syndromes related to intensive use of exercise and was very active in defining the problem of compartmental syndromes in kids. Joe Zuckerman um, helped me write uh, a, an article pointing to the dangers of hardware around the shoulder. Bill Barrett and John Franklin um, were among the uh, pioneers of defining uh, patient reported outcomes in the shoulder in the first place and then defining this problem that was referred to so often this morning of rocking horse loosening of the glenoid component. Mike Morris um, pointed to the value of CT scans in uh, understanding fractures and preventing failure of fixation. Steve Thomas, who I'm proud to say is here tonight, um, published what I think is still the definitive treatment for um, traumatic anterior glenohumeral instability. I asked Dr. Kirby today what approach he used for repairing shoulders of dislocators, and he said this one. Craig Arntz, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, one of my first shoulder fellows, um, actually was the pioneer in the use of the hemiarthroplasty in managing people with cuffed arthropathy and set the stage for the work that Carl and others did with the CTA arthroplasty. Mike Metcalf um, showed that we could uh, shape the glenoid component and manage posterior instability in those that had a posterior ramp. Randy Viola and Craig Boatwright uh, showed that uh, LNI was a comorbidity for just about anything we do around the shoulder. Scott Hacker um, was one of the pioneers in helping us develop the impaction grafting technique that we have used so often both for uh, hemiarthroplasties, CTA arthroplasties, and reverse total shoulders. Emma Woodhouse points out that uh, all causes of shoulder pain are not related to the arthroplasty in patients that are post-TSA because she identified a patient that had metastatic cancer to the acromion. Guy Schmidt uh, pointed out the value of the anteral inferior labrum in uh, centralizing the humeral head on the glenoid. Craig uh, McAllister um, did some great work showing that you could do a wonderful rotator cuff repair without acromioplasty and get an outstanding result so that acromioplasty was not a necessary part of that procedure. Bill Montgomery and Mel Wall, uh, I think, set the stage for a lot of the understanding that's uh, being applied to the Bristow and the Letarge procedure by showing that if you have a bony defect in the glenoid, you need to replace that with bone. And if that's the problem, then bone has to be the answer. And we're able to show that uh, bone grafting can restore stability when you have a glenoid defect. Uh, is Alexis here? I thought that Alexis might be here. Anyway, um, Dr. Falikoff and Dr. Brayman uh, showed us that even though the uh, glenoid components that we retrieve at failed surgery may look okay, when you look at them in detail, their surface anatomy is quite dramatically changed. Carl, I, did you mention that this morning, that what you take out is not like what you put in? And uh, Carl pointed this out, and a lot of the glenoid components, particularly those that were completely conforming, become progressively non-conforming due to selective wear as the humeral head moves back and forth. So, these guys were on that. These two guys uh, did a huge amount of work on the uh, Riemann run, Joe Lynch and Jeremiah Clinton. Tony Bowen Cristiani um, again worked on um, the patient self-assessment, particularly dealing with people that had, had complications of previous instability repairs. Mike Lee, we mentioned this morning, showed that you could actually weaken the humerus by excessive reaming of the medullary canal. Chris Howe showed that all uh, sutures used in rotator cuff repair are not loaded the same and that the position of the shoulder has a huge impact on which sutures are loaded. Annie Lynch showed that if you're doing a two incision uh, repair of a distal biceps and you hyperpronate the arm for too long, you can squeeze off the posterior osseous nerve. Brian Gilmer um, 
did a lot of work on measuring migration of the humeral head after shoulder arthroplasty and did the work that I showed previously this evening about the outcomes of uh, the Raymond Run surgery. Pete Scheffel, uh, along with Jeremiah and Joe, um, did the, a lot of the work on chondrolysis, as did Brett Wider. And again, bless Brett's heart, he, he was involved in this threatening business that took place at the same time. It was a little stressful for him. Uh, Soren Olson uh, did the study that I showed this morning, showing that you can actually heat up the glenoid to toxic levels when you are reaming it. Andrew Merritt uh, worked with uh, Paul Pottinger and, some, and the other group and really did some of the pioneering work in identifying proping, showing that uh, bacterial cultures were common in failed arthroplasty. Akash showed the value of the axillary view and showed that in many cases you didn't need to do a CT scan before shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, Chris and Akash uh, looked at the problem of propy in revised shoulders. Uh, Dr. Louder looked at the connect for measuring shoulder motion. Dr. Sean uh, did the study that he talked a little bit about this morning, uh, talking about the fact that cultures are not simply positive or negative, but there are degrees of positivity, and that probably has a huge effect on the host response to the presence of those spots. So in conclusion, I'd like to just leave you with a thought that each of us has the opportunity to make orthopedics better than we found it. And the interesting thing is that when we try to make orthopedics better, we make ourselves better as well. Thank you very much. I have your attention for just just a few more minutes be people, before people start drifting out. We just have to do a few house housekeeping things, and uh, I'll I'll keep it short. Uh, first, first a couple of thank yous, and uh, I wanted. Uh, Thank Jim Crutcher, who partners with us, uh, at Jim and Swedish, in running the Lecoque Lectureship. And uh, Jim was very sorry he couldn't be here tonight, uh, but he's very invested in this. Uh, every year we get together and talk about how this is really the only function in our community that, that uh, we're aware of, where there's always broad representation from the university and from our colleagues and partners uh, in the community. So he and I have decided we really, really want to keep this going. Uh, I'll put in a little uh, plug. Uh, the Lecoque family was extremely generous uh, when they started the Lecoque lectureship, uh, but the uh, funding hat, the funds that we have available ha have not really kept up with inflation and the cost of running this. Uh, so that is just a, a plug if anybody uh, is feeling generous, uh, that fund could use an infusion of uh, some money. Uh, and I wanna thank also uh, Teresa Jones and Pamela Halberg. They came to this facility with uh, Jim or separately to scout it out uh, to make sure that it really was gonna be an upgrade over the uh, Crown Plaza. Uh, and they really liked it and the price was right. So maybe we'll continue to have it here. And also, uh, Teresa and Pamela did uh, quite a bit of the planning, uh, but mostly I want to thank Christine Palasigi. Is, is Christine here, hopefully? Come on up, Christine. You can come up here. We'll, I'll only make you give a short speech. But, but Christine takes on all kinds of roles in our department with the residency, with the uh, uh, residency graduation, which is a pretty elaborate uh, production. And she's done such a great job with this that I asked uh, uh, Jim Crutcher this year if he would object to just putting all of this in charge of Christine and basically, you know, letting me and Jim just get out of her way. Uh, and he thought that was a great idea. So, so thank you. Thank you. 
And uh, I was just joking about the speech. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, we have a couple of gifts uh, for our uh, guest lecturer, Dr. Matson. And uh, our first thought was to get him a tie, but but seeing the purple and gold that he's wearing tonight, I'm glad we didn't do that. I would imagine he probably has enough of those to outfit all of us in the room with a with a similar tie. But we do have a couple of uh, gifts for him. The most important one of all is in the smallest uh, envelope. Here it is. And we have a, a plaque uh, for the being the 54th uh, Lecoque lecture. Thank you very much. If we if we give you this check, it you know means you still have to come back tomorrow though. Got it. Finish up. Finish up. And uh, uh, these are also for you. And so thank you very much. Oh my God. 